Hello, all. Thanks for coming here. I just wanted to start just kind of giving a, a brief overview of, of why I did the book and kind of how it came about. And then I know there's a lot of questions and I won't, I won't speak too long. I'll just, I mean, what was interesting to me starting in 2006 and 2007, as Dan was describing, was I was covering first the Bush and into the Obama administration, and you could feel that the Iran kind of tether was, was flowing through so many different issues, whether it was covering the Iraq conflict and how much influence the, the Iranian and the Revolutionary Guard had through their Shiite militias in, in Iraq, through Afghanistan and the, the influence the Iranian government had with Hamid Karzai. And, you know, looking back to the, there was some cooperation with, with the Iranians right after 9-11 in setting up the Karzai government. So in these issues, and then as the nuclear crisis started to brew, um, you could see how much kind of U U.S. foreign policy writ large was being tethered to Iran. When Obama came in, whether it was reaching out to the Russians or the Chinese, very much at the center of the, the narrative very early on was the Iranian threat. You know, at first it was, can you help us have sanctions against Iran? So very, that's what got me interested in, in a lot of ways and, and it's sort of so focused on Iran, even though I was based, based in Washington. And it, it is true, my covering the Lebanon war in 2006, you really, it was a Hezbollah Lebanon war, but being in Beirut at the time, Iran was kind of behind the scenes and everyone was talking about the hidden hand. So it was, it was very much um, on my mind as I started to sort of really piece together how the Middle East was changing. And I think a key part of, of my book and I think of, of the Iran conflict over the past eight or nine years, I think it really did revolutionize U.S. national security and the way the U.S., what tools they use to execute it. Obviously, there's been a lot talked about cyber attacks, which is, was basically the first time a, a state used a cyber weapon against another one in the attacks on the nuclear facilities in Iran, but also the, the financial war that the U.S. and others unleashed I would say starting in 2007, but really hit its height in 2012, was it's never been d done before. There's never been that type of financial war where basically the U.S. told the world, the companies, private companies, if you want to do business with America, you can't do business with Iran. And that choice really had a devastating impact on the, on the Iranian economy and was incredibly successful, something both the Bush and the Obama administrations uh, executed uh, very skillfully. Um, the narrative of the story, it starts in Iraq and Afghanistan in some ways, but it really picks up with the, with the Obama administration and covering the campaign in 2008 into the election, it was really interesting that a, a politician from Hawaii who didn't have really Middle East experience was fixated on on Iran from the campaign trail into the first few months. It was it was somewhat of an obsession for Obama to to do this reach to Iran. I kind of in the book I I focus on why that why that is. I think part of it was Obama's kind of worldview. He he lived in places like Indonesia. He kind of I think intuitively had a feeling towards. Countries like Iran or Indonesia that were kind of part of the non-aligned movement that felt that they had been wronged by colonialism or history, and he was kind of intuitively um, had exposure to that. Uh, I also think while he was in the Senate, the issue of nuclear proliferation kind of was the one issue he really grabbed a hold of, um, and uh, and also the issue of extricating the U.S. from Iraq. His some of his closest aides worked on the Iraq study group. If you remember that, it was a big uh -huh. study done in 2007 towards the end of the Bush administration, which focused on basically reaching out to the Syrians and the Iranians as a way to pull out of Iraq and, and kind of end that turmoil. And I think that had a, a big impact. Uh, I know that like, <laughs> there's been a lot of focus on one of Obama's closest advisors, Valerie Jarrett, the fact that she lived in Iran, I, I personally didn't find um, evidence in the book that she was kind of a huge cog in this, in this issue, although she, she is the one advisor who kind of would go upstairs at night after everyone else had left and would have the, the president's ear. Um, the, the policy from the beginning, this outreach to Iran, which started with 
secret, five secret letters that President Obama wrote to the Supreme Leader with this speech he started to give annually on, on Nauru's, the Persian New Year's. And the message from multiple people I talked to who've seen these correspondence was basically, we are not seeking regime change, that we can end this nuclear crisis peacefully, acknowledging some of the wrongs the U.S. had, you know, had done through history and op basically saying that there was a, there was a new path um, towards Iran. But I think what was interesting is his outreach immediately had pretty heavy costs or at least raised serious dilemmas for, for U.S. policy very quickly in the Obama administration, just months after he took office. And as this outreach to the Iranians started to sort of be implemented, the green movement, the, the democracy movement in Iran uh, really took root in, ju in June 2009. And, you know, in, in retrospect, it was, I don't argue it was, a, it was an easy decision whether to somehow embrace them or, or do nothing. The, I've talked to dissidents in the White House would say we were getting very um, mixed messages from opposition groups in Iran. Some were saying, you know, come out and publicly support us because the Supreme Leader is going to crack down anyways and at least we'll have the, you know, the support of the international community and maybe some protection. Uh, others were arguing, you know, stay back. The, the regime will use it as a way to discredit us and, and kind of don't do anything. So in the end, they, they didn't do anything. Um, and I, I think that's one of the more Hillary Clinton and others have come out and said that was one of the biggest mistakes of the first uh, administration because the Supreme Leader cracked down anyways and you kind of lost this, this opening for potential change. And, and that window, I think, has probably closed. May, may, the hope is the nuclear agreement might allow for some gradual change, but I, I haven't heard from any of the Green Movement people that they think there's going to be another opening like that anytime soon. And the other... Um, cost, I think, was the Syria policy. It's, it's still one of the biggest contentious debates in Washington. The White House will say there was never any connection between our policies towards Syria and our policy towards Iran and this, these nuclear talks. But it's, I mean, it's a fact that the secret negotiations with Amman were happening at a very high level, at an accelerated level in August of 2013, just as President Obama announced he was going to enforce red lines in Syria and then backed off. And I interviewed Iranian officials in the book who basically said, you know, the, the word from Tehran was that if th these attacks happen, if the Assad regime is targeted, we will not be able to continue this, this track. And that message was, was communicated. The, the administration will say that was not a factor, but I just think if you, if you pull the string and look where things have gone since August 2013. Uh, the, the, the White House wrote a letter to the Supreme Leader in late 2014 basically saying if we can solve the nuclear question, we could cooperate in Syria on some level against ISIS and your regime should know we are not targeting the Assad regime, we won't. Uh, the CIA, it's been pretty well reported, basically told the rebels if we back you, you have to sign letters basically saying the Assad regime will not be targeted. And, to this day, the Pentagon was communicating to the Iranians through the Iraqis, basically saying, no, that our operations in Syria are not targeting the Assad regime. So there has been sort of this confluence now where U.S. foreign policy towards Syria in a lot of ways is aligned with Iranians and, and Russia, which is a huge, a huge shift. Um, as I was mentioning, the, the book does document that the, the diplomacy was set up what I would argue in a, in a brilliant way, which both the Obama administration and the Bush administration um, were a part of, which was to enact these sanctions, this financial pressure in a way that wouldn't kind of rebound and hurt the United States, cause the US or Europe's own economic recovery to get hit. And that was not uh, an, an easy game to play. There was this tension between, if you really want to hit Iran, you have to target the central bank of Iran. You have to hit their oil exports. And uh, Treasury secretaries from uh, Geithner to Hank Paulson kept saying, you know, we can't play that game. Oil prices will spike, and then we'll, we'll, we're all going to pay a price for this. So this kind of gradual 
but very methodical move by the U.S. government, the Treasury Department, even other arms of the U.S. government, where they they did very kind of systematically um, get a, a coalition. And between 2012 to 2013, they basically they cut Iranian oil exports by more than half. They cut the currency, the, the Iranian currency collapsed by about two thirds, and Iran was basically kicked off the international oil mar uh, financial system, which most people didn't think was, was, was possible. And the Iranians, I know the Iranian officials kind of publicly say, oh, the sanctions didn't have much impact. But I, I know from my own reporting going to Iran that when Rouhani came in, there was a real fear of economic collapse on some level. They had an Ahmadinejad government that kind of looted the financial system. They had they could not get their oil exports home, and they had hundreds of billion dollar black hole inside the financial system. So the only way to close that was was to neg get negotiations, and that's why you saw this rapid move towards um, a deal in the summer of 2013, right after Rouhani uh, took took power. Uh, I guess one of the con conclusions of the book is, is I still kind of as I mapped it out was tactically the negotiating strategy after it was set up in such a brilliant way didn't make a lot of sense to me like usually in a negotiation you want to give the guy a way out but you either are maintaining pressure or in increasing pressure and the administration started to very much walk it back in some ways as the talks went they basically would say well military option is not on the table even though they'd say all options are on the table they'd tell you privately we if we, if any sort of military option would guarantee you a nuclear weapon in Iran, so that was taken off the table, and they started to talk down the sanctions. I mean, I can remember Secretary Kerry Berry publicly saying, "This isn't sustainable. Our partners won't 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 back us for much longer, so we have to basically get a deal a deal now." And that didn't make sense, given what we see now. Is even after the deal, you still see. European banks terrified of opening uh, banking relationships with Iran. You see the oil, when this negotiation started, it was 140 barrels, dollars a barrel. It went down about 30, under 40. So the, the leverage the U.S. had was actually going up even as the U.S. started to sort of pull down back its demands. And I think I've always, I was always sympathetic to the idea of, yeah, you give them some sanctions relief or, or the opportunity to see what you'd gain, but at the same time, you'd, you'd maintain pressure. You wouldn't lessen it. And I think that's why si some analysts and reporters were sort of a bit stunned in the final months of the talks when even red lines or issues they said weren't going to be part of the negotiations, whether it was their conventional weapons, their missile pro uh, program, suddenly the, they were saying, well, you know, we're going to eventually we're going to set up a, a process where their missile sanctions would get lifted, their conventional arms embargo would get lifted, their they started to take off sanctions lists, revolutionary guard commanders, nuclear scientists who didn't really cooperate in any way in addressing the nuclear issue. Uh, the, there was supposed to be a big investigation that would close the agreement uh, and make, make it pretty clear what the Iranians had, had done in the past on weaponization work, and that was basically covered up. The, the U.S. just agreed to, to some very small steps without getting access to the to the to the people and the documents that they needed. So it was still unclear to me why they sort of ratcheted back all this pressure when the tides seemed to be going in the, in the US favor on the negotiations. Um, I guess to conclude now, I just looking at the, at the future, um, at least in the early days, a lot of the, the hope that you'd hear from the White House or the State Department about some kind of great crystal moment at the end of the Obama administration, you know, hasn't happened. I was in New York last week for the UNGA, and there, I know the White House had hoped there'd be a, a handshake, a photograph between President Obama and President Rouhani. Uh, the Iranians actually scripted Rouhani's trip to the New York, so he basically would make sure he was not in the same room with President Obama, which I, is not a great sign, because the guy, his, the moderate leader that the U.S. hoped to empower was so so weak he had to sort of basically hide from the president in the United uh, inside Iran. You've seen a continued arrest of dual nationals, U American Iranians, European Iranians, which seems very much targeted by the supreme leader to make sure that okay, yes, there is going to be 
money coming back to this country, but there's not going to be kind of a flood of of Western thought or even much Western money. We're going we're gonna to guard it. I think he wanted to avert a financial crisis, but he also wanted to avert what he seems to be more concerned about as much as anything, which is like some sort of Western invasion. And he's very much pushed that back. And as I was saying earlier, the, the Iranian presence in Syria, in Yemen, uh, in Lebanon, none of this has stopped. It hasn't moderated. Uh, the White House would say, well, we weren't banking on that. But I think that's a little disingenuous because they, they did hope for some cooperation to end the Syria conflict. And I just think looking ahead, it, it was very much a political bet, a political bet that you restrain the Iranian program for 10, 15 years. And in that time, the Supreme Leader would die. Then you'll have a more moderate uh, government. And, you, and the US won't care as much about who's in charge there. I mean, that's not a crazy bet, except for most of what we've seen um, is that might not be the way it goes, that you could have either a more radical regime or at least a sort of a, a revolutionary guard led government in 10 years and the crisis is just going to kind of repeat itself um, in a decade when the leverage the West had at this time was gone. Um, so let me end it there and so we'll just go to questions. Sure. We'll go to questions and answers because uh, a lot will evolve from the questions. Let me put in put in my glasses here. Oh, oh, there we are. Persist. What's that? Should I sit or should I keep standing? Yeah, you can stand can there. I, okay. It'll be better. Awesome. Uh, uh, Dr. Dan, Dr. Moshe uh, Dan, is he is he the one raising his hand? I guess not. Jeff Dalby. Oh, there you go. Oh. Okay. Uh, um, given what you've said, do you think that Netanyahu? Yeah, you do, do need you it. Think, do you think that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's Iranian policy, um, going to Congress, going to all the other stuff, was wise, given what you've said? I mean, I assume he all, he would also know this or whatever. Second, what advice would you give to the Prime Minister, if you could, or if you wanted to, about what future is Iranian policy policy towards Iran would be should be uh, I mean it's, it's interesting when you look at net the Israeli government's policy towards Iran and it's kind of very vocal hawkish position it took early on I think the Obama administration found it useful I mean you'd, you'd hear US officials say well we could go to the the Chinese and say look we need your help in kind of constraining the Iranians. We know you get a lot of oil from from the, the Iranian government. Um, if the Israelis attacked Iran, your 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 energy assets would be uh, your supply would be cut off. So why don't you work with us um, as to put pressure on Iran, and that that way the Israelis won't attack. So it was there was a time where the, it was. It was, it, I don't know if it was totally coordinated, but it, the U.S. side was using the, the kind of very public hawkish line to, to back <laughs> their policy. But it definitely, in the 20, you know, as the final months of the negotiations um, happened, it was very much a direct conflict between the U.S. and the Israelis. You know, I don't, I don't, I think if Israel was quiet or public, I don't think it would have mattered. I think. The, the White House was so fixated on this deal that if Netanyahu was very much quiet, you know, would it, I still think, I still think the deal would have gotten done along the way it, it did. I guess looking forward, my, my estimation is whether it's Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, they're not going to, I think the, the talk you heard during the campaign from some candidates, the deal would get cut off, you know, torn up in the first few months. I don't see that happening, but I just, there's so many inherent contradictions uh, in the deal that, you know, if, if Iran keeps testing missiles or keeps doing X, Y, and Z in the Middle East, you could see a similar process like there was with the agreement the U.S. had with North Korea in the 90s where they were, they weren't living up to the deal or the, you know, the contra contradictions in that deal about what the North Koreans had committed to. Under the Clinton administration, it, 
it survived because they were politically basically committed to the deal with the North Koreans, as is the Obama administration. I think whether it's Clinton or Trump, there's going to be kind of more willingness to challenge that. So in some ways, the U.S. policy and Israel might kind of get closer again um, after the election. But I guess the smartest policy where things are now is just try to implement that deal as, as much as you, can, as you can and just see how the, the, Iranians, the Iranians play it. Because um, I, I just don't see anyone tearing up the deal from, from day one. I mean, I, implementing the deal, I, I think. Policy. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess Should support su it, but try to get to try to f make sure it's implemented because already we've seen signs that whether it's what how much how much heavy water or other nuclear materials the Iranians are producing, it's kind of more than than what was expected. I think that support the deal, but but point point out the the shortcomings because it's it's th they're real and they're not going to go away and even if you have even if you're not going to see this thing torn out i think that it's going to be scrutinized much more closely in the next coming years and what has been over the past the first what 18 months of the deal first year of the deal as i understand there are three sets of sanctions one related to terrorism right to terror yes the way iran acts in the middle east Second, uh, the missiles problem. Third, nuclear issue. Now what's going on that Iran is asking the cancellation of all the sanctions and Americans are very embarrassed. They don't know what to do and I think that they canceled a lot of sanctions that are not connected to the nuclear issue. W what do you say about it? I guess there were maybe, there were even four. There were, there were sanctions that were imposed for human rights abuses. There were sanctions related to, yeah, support for Hezbollah, support yeah, for yeah, terrorism, right. and then sanctions related to missile development, and then the nuclear sanctions, which got repealed. It was always very difficult to sort of talk, connect or pull them all back and not have any connections. Like some of these banks who got delisted were, were being sanctioned for the ter nuclear program, but they also had links to you know, the missile development or financing Hezbollah. So that was always a very difficult line to draw. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the, the deal was implemented in January of this year. I think there were, there were a couple of sanctions related to the missile program that were put in place, but there haven't been any other new sanctions from the U.S. side. And I, it's going the opposite way. You have John Kerry kind of moving around. Um, Right. But that, that's what I was saying earlier on. I think for this, the rest of this administration, you're not going to see an imposition of new sanctions. You're going to see the opposite, which is them trying to basically draw up business for Iran or at least let others, giving them the green light to do it. So, But I still think when the next administration comes in, who, whoever it is, I just don't see the commitment that the Obama administration had to, to this deal existing in, in the next administration. So if they do start imposing sanctions for human rights, the Iranians have said that's a violation of, of the deal. So that's where I think you're going to see, see tension going, going forward. It's, it's kind of inevitable unless Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton just continue to pull back. But I just don't think that's, in my mind, I don't think that's going to happen. Jay, I'll, I'll ask you a question. We'll go to yeah. Jeff Dalby. Let me just uh, slip in one quick question. In researching the book, obviously, you could have written probably three books from all the raw material you had, right, as opposed to, to one book. It, is there, is there, was there a sense when you're sitting there late at night or five in the morning, whenever you write, a sense of, of, of outrage? Now, when I say outrage, I mean from an intellectual policy point of view. In this whole deal, here you have a deal from an Israeli point of view. I've heard senior Israeli officials say they never would have believed that an American administration would create a direct and acute national security threat to the state of Israel through this arrangement. Um, and I've heard it from more than one. Um, you know, we're, there are billions of dollars of cash that you exposed that may be a lot more money than we thought that are on planes and different currencies. I mean, this is really, I mean, to use a cheap word, it's weird. There's a lot of weird aspects to this entire deal. 
that that defy the ABCs of a Georgetown University, you know, class 101 in diplomacy and national security. Did any of that, did, did any of that filter, or is that just like, you know, those of us who, who have been looking from the side, scratching our heads going, how, didn't they understand the sources of Iranian negotiating behavior? Didn't understand that what they were getting into, and, and the results are clear today. The, the behavior of the Iranian regime, ballistic missiles, confrontation in the United States, uh, supporting terrorism around, it's all gotten worse around the Middle East. And we've just gotten going. I mean, as a journalist, I don't think I, I don't think I would describe it as outrage. To me, it was more like, wow, this as a storyteller, wow, this is a this is the biggest story of the Obama administration. And but I think there were times through the reporting where I was like, wow, I, I can't believe they did that. But yeah. particularly, I mean, I re remember when I, we first got tipped off about the fact that they sent one point seven billion dollars in cash to Iran. My initial respect. You know, I wasn't thinking about even ransom or the politics. I was just thinking, practically, how do you send that much money <laughs> <laughs> to someone in cash? And it's like, it was almost unbelievable. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, it's just reporting this story. It was from the, from the secret talks to the, to the, yeah, some of these payments to the red lines that a few years ago seemed they would, they would never be pulled back, whether it was on their missile program or... I, I remember when they started to uh, you, when the you actually see the the nuclear agreement. It, it took maybe a week to try to understand it. You had all these annexes and names, and you had to put them together to see who. But we started to realize that some of the nuclear scientists who the U.S. had been targeting as being behind the weaponization program was a guy named Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. The Iranians denied they existed. These guys were figments of our imagination. But then when we started to piece together the agreement, you could see they were going to get off the sanctions list. And yet they never, the Iranians never forced, and the uh, international community never forced these scientists to cooperate in any of these investigations. So to me, it was like, how can you be letting these guys off when they didn't even cooperate in, in one of these, you know, fun, one of the fundamental parts of the agreement? And, and you could never really get answers to that. At least, you know, coherent ones. Mm -hmm. So there was head scratching. There was head scratching and sometimes awe of wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I promised that Jeff Dalby, uh, ZOA, and then uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Woodlansky. So. Uh, Jay, to follow up on what you just said, and given that uh, all that you have uh, revealed about the cash transfers, and I thank you for that. Uh, I, maybe you can help clear up a little confusion that I have about uh, a bill that was just introduced in Congress by Congressman Ed Royce. He's the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. It's, I believe, H.R. 5931, which is uh, prohibiting uh, future payments of Ransom Act. And uh, it seems uh, after every reading that I have done of that bill, and I have done quite a few, uh, it seems to me like a very, very plain vanilla bill, and Obama and Kerry and Kirby have all denied up and down, backwards and forwards, that that, that was not a ransom payment. So why is Obama saying that he is going to veto that bill? Uh, uh, 180 days, uh, the State Department has to file a report, and nothing much more in that bill other than that. What is their objection to that bill? That's a, that's an interesting question. Um, there is there, there's what about five six months left in the Obama administration. There are still claims. I mean, Pre President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif were both in New York last week, and they were very much fixated on um, Iranian money still in the United States. There's there was a two billion dollar basically of Iranian money that was frozen in. Citibank in New York. This is 2009, and the Supreme Court a few weeks ago basically ruled that that money belongs to U.S. victims of Iranian-backed terror, particularly the, the uh, Marine barracks in '83 in Beirut. So that money's there, and there are still Americans in Iranian prisons. Some of them recently um, arrested. Rouhani was pretty open, I thought, where he said, oh, you know, we, we, we had these two tracks of negotiating over this money and re release of these prisoners, and we did this 
exchange in January. Maybe we can do it again. So from the Iranian side, they haven't been very subtle in, in making the argument that maybe this another type of deal could happen. Knowing how the political, how, how combustible the reaction was to the, the $1.7 billion settlement, politically, it would be seen, I don't know how the Obama could have another agreement, but, you know, who knows? Maybe that's, that is one of the aspects, is he wants to get these other Americans home. There's still that money out there, and that there could be a similar type transaction or deal as there one in January. I mean, it's, and there are also other payments. They, they bought, the U.S. bought about eight, nine billion dollars worth of heavy water from Iran. This was a few months ago. It was part of, they want, the U.S. wanted to help the Iranians stay below a cap that was part of the agreement, so they paid, uh, they paid for that. I don't know if the ransom, I mean, sorry, the agreement, the veto is somehow tied into that. They think it could make it more difficult to do those types of transactions. But yeah, all that, all that stuff is still very much in the air. And the, the Iranian government officials last week in the UN were pretty open in saying, you know, we have this exchange in January, something like that could happen again. They, they were very public about it. Dr. Michael Levasky? Uh, I have a quick question. Maybe it's not so quick, but <clears throat> I think it cuts to the core. Um, what do you see as the main motivational factor for the Obama administration coming in in 2009 and reaching out secretly to Iran? There have been three motives that have been discussed publicly, and one which existed in the Bush administration which was the avoidance of war with Iran. That's one. Another, to stop the bomb, although there was argument about whether Iran was going for a bomb. In 2006, 2007, the National Intelligence Estimate, written by Paul Pilar, said they're not going for a bomb. He was then made a laughing stock because all the other intelligence agencies in the world said, you're out of your mind. And there's a third factor, which has come in more recently, which is that Iran can be a useful foe of ISIS or ISIL. But of course, all of this began before ISIS even existed. So I want to ask you, is there a fourth factor beyond the rather hazy idea of President Barack Obama being a person who believes in anti-hegemonism, anti-colonialism, perhaps influenced by Edward Said, et cetera, et cetera, is there something beyond that? After all, you say it's not Valerie Jarrett. It's very clearly coming from Obama himself. He's been using Ben Rhodes, the deputy national security advisor, as his front man. He hasn't been using any of his national security advisors as the main thrust, nor the CENTCOM commander or anybody else. What is the main reason? I mean, I think, I think there are multiple reasons. I mean, I do think Obama and Kerry convinced themselves, and I think it's, I don't think it was true, but I think they convinced themselves that there was going to be another war if there wasn't this agreement. And you, you, I think the push in 2012 to start this diplomacy really quickly came at a time when the, you'd hear talk in the White House that the Israelis are going to attack, or we're seeing them do some training. So I think part of the, the real push for negotiations was kind of to, to restrain the Israelis or to make sure that that type of attack didn't happen. So I, do, I, do, I, don't, I don't think, I never personally thought there was going to be a war, but I think that President Obama and John Kerry, and in the book I interviewed Kerry, and he gave this quote, it's, I do not um, for a second doubt the idea that there would have been a conflict if there wasn't, there would have been a war without this deal. So I do think there was that. But I also think there is kind of a, People describe it as reorientation or that the Obama administration wanted to sort of shift kind of the U.S. alliances or position in the Middle East. And you, part of that was at first they tested the Syrians and that, that didn't really, but they tried. They, they tried to really reach out to Assad and they tried to reach out to Iran. And I do think they're not even that, they kind of talk about it, that the U.S. should be more balanced. They shouldn't be in the Sunni Arab camp against the Iranians. They shouldn't just be in the Israeli camp against the Iranians. They should be, they should be 
somewhere kind of in the middle, and they should kind of be able to reorient between the two. And I think you've seen that in, in recent weeks in Washington, where there's a the Saudi government really is getting whacked these days. There's all sorts of legislation, you know, tied to 9-11. There's a push to um, ban arms sales to, to Saudi Arabia tied to Yemen. So I... I I don't think a lot of Democrats wouldn't have been would have been pushing this without at least a wink from the White House on some level. So I do think, you know, some of this stuff about understand like Obama's willingness to right wrongs of the past or anti-colonialism. I mean, I do think there's probably some of that um, for just reading and knowing how he grew up. But I do think he's trying to reorient the U.S. policy, and you know that I think we've seen that has. Maybe potentially it could work in, in the longer term, but it, I think in the short term it's had it's been destabilizing in the sense you talk to Saudi officials, they think the U.S. has basically sold them out, so they're going to go into Yemen, you know, full guns blazing because they don't believe they can rely on the U.S. and the U.S. is p playing footsie with the Iranians. I think in Syria, uh, you know, that conflict is so polarized now, and I I, th I think one of the weirder parts or you were talking about the inexplicable parts of writing this book, the part I never could understand, there was so much support for the Iran deal from the left in a lot of ways as an anti-war uh, element, and yet there was all this horror about what was going on in Syria and, and the, the atrocities there, but there was never much of a connection between, well, who's back in the Assad regime? More than anyone, it's been the Iranians, and, and sort of nothing in this agreement has subdued the Iranian position in Syria. And I, I think they do have a lot more assets now to continue that conflict. And there's no, you know, we've seen it right now that m more focus is on the Russians and the, the, the Syrians bombarding on Aleppo, but the Iranians are very much part of that coalition. I, I want to suggest as a follow-up, I haven't studied this, but uh, the Syrian outreach against the wishes of Congress was 2011, if I'm not mistaken, of the sending of the ambassador. But the, the outreach to Iran occurred basically simultaneously to President Obama's general outreach to the Islamic world, the address in Cairo, the visit to Turkey, and particularly to the Muslim Brotherhood. And I want to suggest that it might be possible to think that he was simultaneously reaching out to two very powerful forces in the Islamic world, one Sunni, one Shia. And his belief that he should reach out to the anti-establishment forces that he felt were actually the new wave, the next page. That's all I'm suggesting. Right. Well, he did, on the Syria front, though, he did send emissaries to, I mean, it was interesting, even during the campaign, some of the advisors who ended up getting positions in the Obama administration, we're having meetings with President Assad and Foreign Minister Mualim, and it was in, yeah, it was in the first few months of the Obama administration in 2009 that they sent emissaries to Damascus to meet Assad. So, what you're saying could be true, but yeah, the the Syria outreach and the Iranian outreach happened immediately, and it it, it was it was not a secret. I mean, they were very much highlighting that this was what's gonna, what's going to happen during the campaign. Obama gave a big speech to AIPAC and in 2008, and he, he basically outlined what they were going to do, and they did it. Obama empowered Iran, a Shiite country. Shiite are about 15% of the Arabs. Okay? How come that he thought that the Sunnis will accept it? So on the other side, as Zelensky said, he reached out to the Muslim brothers. But who are the Muslim brothers? Some, maybe the, the CIA chief uh, should have told him something about it, but his, he was his friend, John Brennan, who was in the uh, representative of CIA in, so in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, I think. Yes, so, and listen, Muslim brothers are the mother and the father of all present Sunni terrorism. Daesh comes from Muslim brothers. Al-Qaeda comes from Boko Haram, Somalia Shabab. All of them come from Said Qutb, from, from, from Jihad, a jihadi way of thinking, you see? So all the th things which are completely clear to us, being uh, educated, lived, uh, born in the United States, was not 
accepted, understood by the White House, something is very wrong. The way of thinking is naivete. What, what does it? What does he want? You see. And now Israel, because Israel is not Sunni, <laughs> yet a Shia, just Jewish, it's in, in, big, in big danger. But not only Israel, all the Middle East. In, in his last, uh, and I'll finish here, in his last uh, um, speech in the United States, only a few years ago, he said that the, w the world is in a wonderful situation. It's completely calm. There's something in the Middle East, but don't, don't, don't mention it. How come? Something is wrong. He's the man, the White House. You see, so all of us, we, 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 are, we, we are fear to, 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 to say what I just said, but that's the problem. We, no, but no one in Israel understands, and even in Europe probably, and many United States, what you wanted, that man. Now he's going to out, okay, in uh, three or four months. But something has happened, something very, very bad happened. You cannot just go around and try to explain it or whatever, you see. He, he, he asks you a very d difficult question, and your answers were not good. I'm, I'm, I don't <laughs> blame you. I don't blame you. Yes, but at least it's, it's deeper. It's much deeper <laughs> than you said. You Looking toward the future, um, <clears throat> reportedly, Russia and Iran are now in an alliance. They've reached out to Turkey. And, on the other, and, and as far as Europe, uh, there was a report recently that uh, the president of Iran is going to Germany, and it's not just about business. Uh, do you see that Europe may play a, a bigger role in, in an alliance with Russia, Iran, Turkey, um, and other alliances in the future that would be also detrimental to Israel's foreign policy? And that's an interesting question, I mean, because there has, you know, the, the, the Syria, the Russian role now in, in Syria and kind of the, the U.S. government's kind of green lighting it or acceptance of it, I think, has really caused a big shift in the region. U.S. allies from Jordan to Egypt, even Israel in some ways, are having kind of major continuous dialogue with, with the Russians about what their, you know, what their position is. I think there's been like a vacuum because the U.S. has pushed back, pulled back, and the Russians have gone, have gone in there in a lot of ways, and countries have kind of turned towards them as, you know, a possible stabilizing force. I think in the long term, it's hard to kind of see that because I think Putin and the Russians have used the, serious, the Syria crisis in a way to, to really weaken Europe, and divide it. You know, the, I don't think that the refugee floods into, into, the, into Europe have kind of played to Putin's desire to sort of fracture the European Union. And I, I think in that sense, it's hard to see the Russians playing a stabilizing role, but I do think you see countries turning toward, towards them, and you do see this alliance forming where the Russians have been launching airstrikes into Syria from Iran, which you know, the Iranians weren't happy about that being made public, but the idea that they'd even allow it was pretty stunning to me, consider, understanding Iran, Iranian kind of nationalism and the fact that they'd, you know, that they'd let the Russians do that. So it does feel like there's, there is kind of interesting, if not dangerous, new alliance is forming as the U.S. has pulled back. And it's, it's so fluid, it's hard to see which ones are sustainable. The Russians and the Turks were at each other's throat a few months ago. Now they're talking. The Turks and the Iranians traditionally are adversaries, but there, there is this fear. I've heard it from some of the Sunni Arab leaders that you're having kind of two great religious states now in the region, Turkey, a Sunni one, and Iran. Um, a Shiite one, and they're they're going to be threats. So it's I think everything's kind of in play and and in, in flux. And even if I think Hillary Clinton, her instincts is to be more assertive to try to build up these old alliances. I, it's just the party itself, the Democratic Party, has changed a lot. So it's going to be interesting to see how much she could really act on what seemed to be her her natural instincts. And also, you've got Trump, who they say is closer to Russia uh, in his uh, de business dealings. Do you right. see that there would even be a closer alliance between Russia and the United States if he gets in? I mean, he talks about it, but what's, what's been interesting in the last few months is I don't think a U.S. government could have been trying harder to align itself with Russia than Obama has in the last few months. I mean, they've basically first said Assad must go, and then they were very critical of us with Russian airstrikes in 
inside uh, Syria. And you've seen John Kerry for the past few months basically dying to have some sort of military cooperation with the, with the Russians. And even then, they basically talked about it and then kept doing. I mean, it was it seemed like the Russians very much were using the diplomacy as cover to keep doing what they were doing and to establish facts on the ground. So Trump can talk about it. I don't know what he could do that would be any more sort of aggressive to align the U.S. with Russia than what Kerry and Obama have done over the past six months. Um, Jay, you talked about from the American side, it feels like the deal is probably here to stay. Talk about tearing it up is probably just that talk. I, I wondered if you had a sense of the equivalent dynamic on the Iranian side, like are the hardliners, are the Revolutionary Guard actively trying to undermine the deal or is it basically working for them? You know, is the deal still popular in Iran? How does Rouhani's upcoming election affect that kind of thing? I mean, I think I wrote an article about it in the journal a few weeks ago that I think in a lot of ways the Supreme Leader, who is the hardest hardliner, in a lot of ways kind of got what he wanted for now. He got, I think he did understand in 2013 that his country was in real financial straits. Apparently Rouhani gave like a three hour PowerPoint presentation to the Supreme Leader showing how what was an economic crisis could have become a national security crisis to Iran. And I think he understood economically they had to make this deal. So I think from his perspective, for the time being, he's the financial threat to his country is gone. The economics, the amount of money flowing in might not be as great as some Iranian businesses want, but it's he also is kind of warding off this threat of some sort of Western cultural and economic invasion. So I think he's got a pretty good balance right now between enough money coming in that the system stays afloat, but not so much that he could somehow lose control of it. On the other elements, you know, from the nuclear side to his weapons um, and military development, he's he's doing what he wanted. I think you know he's their miss their missiles are being developed. They're continue even with the agreement. They're kind of modifying and improving their centrifuge machines, other parts of the nuclear insta um, fuel cycle. So in 10 years, they could basically go to an industrial scale nuclear program with all of these other components finished. So I think on that score, he doesn't really, I think he sees it in his interest and he's doing what he's doing in the rest of the region with more funds. So from the Iranian side, I would, I would think though there's complaints from the public or from Zarif that they're not getting enough economic um, of payoff. I think from the Supreme Leader's view, it's, 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 he played his cards pretty well. So I, from their side, I don't see them collapsing the deal. I think it's more the question is, does the U.S. start to enforce some of the other elements that they have? And that could pre precipitate a crisis. I think that's a, that's a real possibility. And again, the North Korea thing, I think, is similar because the Clinton administration had a deal very similar with North Korea, which was basically cap your nuclear program, we'll give you economic benefits. Then when Bush came in, they, they said you were cheating here, you were cheating there, and the, the whole process collapsed in a few months. So I, I think how hard it's enforced going forward is probably the most, that would be the most threat to the deal, I think. And there's in the back, yeah. Um, you spoke a bit about uh, the lack of evidence of real leverage that the U.S. has got politically out of the deal with the Iranians, but there's been an alignment anyway against ISIS in Iraq and Syria in particular. If not real political leverage, do you see any evidence of um, more contact between the U.S. and the Iranians privately uh, in Iraq, for example, as a result of the deal? Are there more conversations? Does the State Department, the CIA see any kind of political payoff or, or are relations as frosty as ever? I mean... I think the part of the danger to the deal is the, the engagement is so personalized. It's basically John Kerry, Javad Zarif talking multiple times during a day, and some of the top people around Kerry had developed relations with some of the top foreign ministry people. But I don't think it really developed much beyond that at all. Uh, I think the Americans have communicated to the Iranians via the Iraqi government uh, about operations in Iraq in Syria, uh, but I, I think the Iranian government has been very strategic to try to keep that at bay. I mean, every speech the Supreme Leader gives, you know, this was only about this agreement and 
it's not very good anyways, and we got suckered, but we're going to play with it. And the, the people they're arresting, it's so, it's so tactical, you know, this Iranian-American businessman, I think a lot of people, this guy named Siam Aknamazi, I think was going to be one of the guys who could be like a forward, you know, thrust for Iranian-Americans going back to do business. The arrest of him has really scared the, the dickings out of Iranian-Americans. You, you, you hear a lot who were talking about going back a few months ago saying the, the environment isn't right. And I think that was by, by design. So I think some of the criticism of the U.S. side that they didn't do enough to, to you know, bring economic benefits, I think is a, is a little twisted because if the regime itself is sending out signals that it's not safe to come back to the very people who are normal, you know, when China opened up, it was Chinese Americans going back in a big way. Um, the fact that they're, they're sending these warning signs to European Iranians and Iranian Americans, I think is, is not, I think it's a very, you know, tactical move by the hardliners. Actually, that's what I wanted to ask. How many uh, American Iranians and British Iranians uh, are being held now uh, by the Iranians? How many have they arrested? Do you see an increase in the number? And do you see any uh, uh, potential for human rights violations uh, being, uh, the sanctions being implemented there? We, we know that over the last 18 months, I think they've arrested four Iranian Americans. There was a father and a son. There was a guy, a guy from San Diego who went back. We still don't know what happened to this FBI agent, Robert Levinson, who disappeared. The, the mother of the, this f father and son team is seen as basically under house arrest. And then mm -hmm. I think there were another five, six or seven it's European, yeah. um, Amer uh, European Iranian. So there's, yeah, I don't know if it's, in my estimation, they basically, they, it's almost like they keep a certain number. And, you know, they gave back five, four in January, and then basically another four got put in prison. So it seems like they like to keep a certain number as leverage. Um, and if you remember in 2009, they had the three hikers, American hikers who got thrown in jail, and then they got out. So it seems very, I mean, part of the book, I, I think, shows that it's, a, it's very cyclical in that sense. If you go back to the revolution in 79, this kind of cycle of, it's very transactional. You know, the, the, hostage, the American diplomats got taken. In response, the Americans unfroze the assets of the Shah and sent them back as part of the Algiers Accords. The Iran-Contra scandal was kind of similar. So there's a, there's a cycle of this that goes back decades, and it seems like it's, it's happening again. I mean, if you, look, if you take a step back, it, it does seem like this cycle is going on again. The moderate hardliner notion. Do you see moderates in Iran? I mean, I feel like the, I feel like the search for moderates in Iran has gone along for a long time. I feel like Rafsanjani is the moderate. Rouhani is a moderate. Although Rouhani was the head of the NSC for so many years for 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 the supreme leader and the guy who Musavian talked about how they would pray for Rouhani and people talk about him as a moderate. Is he a moderate? Uh, is the uh, Rafsanjani the one bomb? Rafsanjani is he a moderate? And to the extent that you see, uh, there is a division between these guys. Where is the power center at the moment? You know, uh, do the do the Rouhani guys have power? Is he making reforms? Is there a chance there? What do the people around him say? What's the attitude? What's the situation? I mean, the best way to look at Iran is like an oligarchy. You've got the supreme leader and his foundations. You have the um, revolutionary guard and all of his and all of their businesses, which really dominate the economy and they dominate the. Um, all the security apparatus inside Iran. So even though, you know, I think it's true. If you go to Iran and you talk to people, there's not like this great love for the revolution, but they've, they've very much consolidated the economic and security apparatus around those institutions. And I do think there's a risk that as this money goes back as part of the deal, the institutions who are going to get it are largely part of this oligarchy. I mean, I do think... Talk to, I've talked to enough of Rouhani advisors. On the one hand, he's died in the wool revolutionary supports the system. I, I do think if he had his way, he'd pro he could normalize relations with the U.S. and Europe in, in a way to, to get economics. I think they do understand they need economic reform. And I, 
they've tried to do some of that in the couple of years that they've been in power, but they haven't done any of the political reforms that I think a lot of the younger people hoped, whether it was releasing prisoners or kind of softening some of the restraints inside the country. Um, and even on the economic reform side, it's been really limited. Um, I talked to some diplomats who were recently in Saudi Arabia, and you, you know, this new, the, the new young deputy prime minister of, or the deputy crown prince of Saudi Arabia, they are talking about all these types of reforms, privatization, X, Y, and Z. You don't hear that from Iran, really. Like, I, I think the idea that there would be this deal and they'd have a huge economic opening, that's definitely not, not happening. But the, the power center still very much is with the Supreme Leader and the Revolutionary Guard, and there's, like, no signs that's diminishing. If anything, I think Rouhani could be weaker in his second term if he's reelected. What's your assessment of Iran's current support for Hamas? And um, do you think that the deal has had, a, had any impact on that support? Thanks. I mean, I've heard from U.S., Israeli, and Arab officials that financial support from Iran to Hamas has shrunk in recent years. Um, I think it was pr pretty open that you know, when Hamas pulled its leadership out of Damascus and kind of moved to Turkey and Qatar, there was definitely a breach in, in, in the relationship between Iran, the Revolutionary Guard, and Hamas. Um, and, it's, and it's diminished financially in, in some ways. But there, the contacts are, are still there. Uh, I, just, I think it's going to be interesting to see how things play out in the next, next couple of years with the conflict in Syria. It's, it's hard to see Hamas and Iran having the relationship they did in, in light of what, what happened in Syria, but they still, you know, they still keep those links. They're still in a Hamas ambassador in Tehran. Those, those links are, are definitely still there. You talked about the opening a few years ago and that window closed. What conditions do you think would have to be in place or in what kind of scenario do you see an opening like that and kind of young moderates kind of getting that opening and getting that opportunity um, going forward, if at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the big kind of elephant in the room is the Supreme Leader. Like, he's in charge. He is he and his son very much control the power through the, the Revolutionary Guard. While he's alive, it's hard for me to see much of a change. He's just, his whole worldview is seen through opposition to the United States. He's very much kind of withdrawn. He doesn't meet, he doesn't travel, he doesn't meet people really who from a, the non-Islamic world, non kind of axis of resistance type. So I think the, the, the bet, I've heard it in the White House too, you know, he's not going to be around for much longer. He's 77, he's had cancer. So I don't think it's crazy to think he's not around in four or five years. Um, I mean, that's, that's an interesting, the, the best analogy I've seen of what will happen when he's gone is kind of what happened in the Soviet Union towards the end where you kind of had after, I guess, Brezhnev died, you had kind of a, a cycle of kind of weaker top leadership and the military kind of taking over more. I, I think that's the scenario I've heard most is like if there'll be weaker supreme leaders, but the Revolutionary Guard will kind of use that as a front to consolidate its power. I guess the, yeah, the, the what's hard to tell is yeah, he, he dies and there's there's a much bigger shake up and, and Rouhani or Zarif or some of these guys somehow come out more powerful after the Supreme Leader is gone. But I, I don't think there's going to be a shift until he, he's gone. And, and then it's just really hard to predict. Summary question. Sure. Your book is called The Iran Wars, Spy Games, Bank Battles, and the Secret Deals that Reshape the Middle East. As we are moving forward, how do you see this Middle East being reshaped? What does it look like right now to you, in your view, having reported on this for 20, uh, more than two decades? Not, not that long. <laughs> no, I, th I think you have a situation where U.S. foreign policy has definitely helped Iran become a much more powerful actor across Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and on the Iranian side in this equation, it's, it's, I tried in the book, and it's hard not to. I, they're not sort of this, in a lot of ways, they're not a giant power in the sense that they're, their economy is in tatters, and it's, it's not like great technology is coming out of there. So they've basically been able to play a very shrewd game 
through their militias and diplomacy to expand their their presence, but they're also economically weak and they're going to get stronger because of this deal, but they're not going to be an economic power. But I think yeah, you've, you've got the Iranian camp, you've got the Turkey kind of Qatar Muslim Brotherhood philosophy playing its role. So you have those kind of two Sunni uh, Shia camps. And you have, I think that the big kind of question is what happens to Saudi Arabia. There seems to be a lot more concern now that this, the Saudi system is weak, that there's so much political change that it's going to be difficult for the this young deputy crown prince to consolidate power. So I, I think you have all these different competing interests and then the Russians coming in and kind of creating their alliances. And I think those different strains are all going to play out over the next 10 years. And what's just hard to tell is if the Americans are really going to re-engage there or not. Mm -hmm. Open question. Well, Jay Solomon, the chief uh, foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and the author of The Iran Wars, we thank you very much.